verses. Let's take a look at 1 Corinthians 4, verses 16 and 17. This is what Paul tells us. Therefore, we do not lose heart, though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. Listen to this part. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. Think about that and let your head wrap around that one. Think about the lemons that are in your life right now. Paul's not telling you that your lemons are insignificant because they're big, guys. I know that there are people in this room that are going through some massive things, and you are here today. You might have limped here, but you are here today. And Paul is telling you what he knows the truth to be. No matter what you're going through right now, in comparison to what is to come on the other side of eternity, these are light. Now, if that doesn't make you excited, I don't know what will. When I count my troubles and the things that are in my pathway, and they are hard, and it is tough, and it is heavy, and there's a lot of tears that goes on. If these are considered light to the amazingness that is about to come, when I meet Jesus face to face, bring it on. Because these are only momentary troubles. My days on this earth are going to end And when I cross over into eternity and I get to live in the amazingness that is heaven with Jesus, that's what we have to remember when that lemon is right in front of our face. Paul continues, so we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. Since what is seen is temporary. But what is unseen is eternal. Hallelujah. That makes me excited. Paul never lost heart and neither should we. Why? Because the difficult things we see and experience all around us is not all that there is. (laughs) This word tells us your stuff, your lemons, the junk in your life, that's not all there is. And if you're not getting into here, and you're not discovering the truth and what this says, then yeah, it may feel like this is all there is. And this is heavy and this stinks and it sure is sour. So if you want to deal effectively with your problems, with your lemons in life, we must fix our focus on someone and something, both capitals, that is beyond ourselves and beyond our current situation. Paul says this to fellow believers in Corinth. In 2 Corinthians 1, verses 8 through 9, he says, We do not want you to be uninformed. Uh Uh-oh. That's always scary when somebody tells you, I've got to be truthful with you. I'm a homeschooling mama, and I have some friends that have been praying and seeking about homeschooling, and um, I've been very honest with them because I don't want them to think that it's all just dreamy because it's hard. And there's many days that I want to drop my children off at the nearest police or fire station for a little while because I'm with them all the time. So it's only fair that I am honest and say, you know what, you're going to have really good days. And you're going to have triumphant days. And then you're going to have days that are just the pits. And you're going to wish that they were in school somewhere so you had a little break. Well, that's what Paul is telling the fellow believers right here. He says, we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers and sisters, about the troubles we experienced in the province of Asia. We were under great pressure, far beyond our ability to endure. So that we, oh, wait, 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 wait. Oh, about, oh, back up. Here we go. See, welcome to the springs. We do not want you to be uninformed, brothers and sisters, about the troubles we experienced in the province of Asia. We were under great pressure, far beyond our ability to endure, so that we despaired of life itself. Indeed, we felt we had received the sentence of death. Well, doesn't that sound like dreamy fun? 
And some of you know exactly how that feels right now. You feel despaired. You feel like your troubles are too much. You feel like you have been sentenced to death. It certainly doesn't feel like running through a field of daisies at all. If anyone had a reason to wallow in their lemons, it was Paul. I don't know about you guys, but sometimes when my lemons, my troubles, the things that come in life, I am just like a pig wallowing in the mud. I just wallow all in them, just lathering it everywhere, giving myself the world's biggest pity party. I mean, blowing up helium balloons and hanging streamers and just wallowing in my stuff. And if anybody had a right to do that, that was Paul. Snake bitten, shipwrecked, beaten, belittled. He had nothing. He didn't have a safe house to go home to and retreat for a little while. No, 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 not Paul. But yet he was able to look beyond his troubles. He looked beyond his lemons. And this is what he continued to say the very next verse. He says, but this happened that we might not rely on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. He has delivered us from such a deadly peril and he will deliver us again. On him we have set our hope that, we will content, that he will continue to deliver us as you help us by your prayers. <clears throat> Let's take a break there. Prayer is important. If you don't have people praying for you, find people to pray with you. That prayer support is so important. And Paul just says that right here. Your prayers matter. He continues, then many will give thanks on our behalf for the gracious favor granted us in answer to the prayers of many, because God's going to answer those prayers, and people around you are going to be witnesses to that, and it doesn't bring glory to you and your situation. It brings glory to God. Paul was focused on what was happening, was, was focusing on what was happening in him and not what was happening to him. And a lot of times I know that I have personally gotten that backwards. I have focused on the pain that's happening to me. It's uncomfortable. I don't like this, Lord. But I have to change my focus. God, what are you doing in me? How are you strengthening me to make you famous in this world? Don't let me focus on what's happening to me. The secret to handling your lemons is to focus on more than your own problems. I have gone through seasons where that lemon is all I could see and that lemon is all I could focus on and that lemon got all of my time and thoughts and efforts, trying to get rid of it, mewling over it, thinking, how did it, how did I get to this place? Instead of focusing on things eternal. Oh, Ashley, that's so hard to do. I know. Believe me. But I'm here today to bring you the word of God so that we can be equipped to look beyond these lemons. Let's fix our eyes on the eternal in every area of our life. And sometimes I really think that we think things are our problem, and I think it's our focus that's out of focus or focusing on the wrong thing. Maybe you're expecting from this life what only can come from God. Maybe you're expecting to receive from other people what you can only receive from God. Maybe you're expecting possessions and experiences to fulfill you in deep ways that really only God can fulfill you. There is not a person in this room, there is not a person in this world that can feel that deep place within you like God can. There is not a new car. There is not a new home. There is not a vacation that can fulfill you the way that God can. Those things are great and they are wonderful. But when you are putting all of your hope and expectations in going to Target after church today and feeling that empty space in you because you go to the dollar spot and you buy $100 worth of stuff from the dollar spot and you're like, woo, I'm going home with stuff. Next week, you're going to be like, oh, man, that bill stinks. I really did not need that cute little lemon to sit on my table. (laughs) Be good stewards of what the Lord has given you. 
We need to get our focus off this life, off what we receive from people, beyond what we own or we want to experience, and we must constantly remind ourselves of the eternal focus before us. And remember, it's unseen. And so it's really hard for us in this fast-paced world to say, mm, I got to shift my focus from what is seen to what is unseen. So let's focus on the eternal. How do we do this, Ashley? Well, number one is we need to focus on Jesus. If you are taking notes, write this down. I will focus on Jesus. Two ways to focus on Jesus. Pray. Oh, pray. Thou art God, great, almighty. How do I pray? You pray and you talk to him like you would talk to your friend. You tell him how good he is. Start there. God, you are so good. Look at this beautiful day you have given us in May. God, you are so good. I thank God when I see the big fluffy clouds here in Vegas, right? Ah, big fluffy clouds. I love them. Find little areas to thank him and just thank him. And then pray. Prayer is not so much something that you do, but it's the person you're with. And that person is Jesus. The other thing, focusing on Jesus, is worship. I have news for you. It's great news. It's awesome news. Worship is not just a 15-minute time on Sunday morning. Worship happens all throughout the week. The Bible says you can sing a new song unto the Lord. You should hear my new songs sung unto Jesus. Jesus, thank you for saving me from this bear. Thank you, Lord. <laughs> Guys, you can go to Amazon Music. You can go to iTunes. You can go to Apple Music. Is that the same thing? I don't even know. Okay, sorry. sorry. I'm sorry. Um, go to YouTube. This Pandora. You don't even have, Spotify. Go there. Type in worship music. Turn on the radio. Turn it off of your country music. Listen, I like country music too. But if you are having a bad day and you turn on the country music and you're singing some kind of twangy <laughs> song, it's just going to get worse. <laughs> I'm be honest with you. You're going to be even more depressed. But turn on some worship music. And I will tell you, when you have that lemon in front of you, it is a sacrifice to praise. That is the last thing you want to do. You want to yell. You want to scream. You want to throw that pity party. You want to pick up the phone, and you want to talk to somebody. Mm, I love y'all. And you want to complain. You want to possibly gossip. I know, because I've been there. It's easy because there's somebody talking back to me on there, validating how I feel. Okay, all right, okay, I'm in the right. Okay, good. But God wants us to come to him. It's a sacrifice. Because guess what? You're likely not going to hear something audible. But he's going to lead you to the word. And if you've never experienced that, ask him, Lord, I want to experience that. Lead me. There was one morning I remember waking up super early on a Sunday morning many years ago. And I asked the Lord, do you see me? God, do you see me? And then I turned on um, Pandora, I think it was. It was a song about how God sees me. He spoke to me. I'm for sure. And I sat there and I cried. I'm like, yes, you do see me. And thank you for loving me enough that I can come back to you time after time after time and keep asking you these questions. God, do you see me? And he's a loving, loving God. And he says, yeah, baby, I do. I see you. I got you. So when it is a sacrifice to pray and a sacrifice to worship, do it anyway. Because I promise you from experience that on the other side of your worshiping, your problems feel a whole lot lighter. And that lemon is further away. And you're able to see in your peripheral vision around that lemon a lot more than you did before. It's a sacrifice. Bring him your sacrifice. Uh, let's look at Hebrews 12, 1 and 2. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, 
Let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. Throw it off, guys. Shake it off. Shake it off. And let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Fixing our eyes where? On Jesus. Fix your eyes on Jesus, not on your limb and not on your thing. Jesus, the one who's the pioneer and the perfecter of faith. It's a good place to fix your eyes. Number two, thing to focus on for eternity is I will focus on generosity. By being a giver and not always a taker, we use our resources for eternal purposes. Giving is one of the most eternally significant ways we can serve. Guys, the Bible calls us to be stewards, not hoarders. You're not on the hoarders show or whatever that is. We are to steward what God has given us. Pastor Randy Alcorn said it like this, we can't take it with us, so we'd better send it on ahead. How can we invest in future generations? How can we invest across the world right now? How can we invest right now in our neighborhood? Matthew 6, 19 and 20, through 21 says, Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moths and vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Verse 24 says this, No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Money is good. We need it. It, says, it doesn't say that, the, that money is the source of all evil. It says the love of money is the source of all evil. So if you're loving money more than anything else, there's some trouble there. If you've got to have things and stuff and things and stuff and things and stuff, and I've got to accumulate and accumulate and accumulate, your focus is going to ultimately lead you to a big old fat lemon. So let's store up treasures in heaven where they will be lasting. And I want you to keep in mind, I am not talking about tithing right now. In my opinion, based on the word of God, tithing is, that's his we're just asked to be obedient and give back to him what he has already given to us. And if you're new or you haven't been in church in a while, tithing is just 10%. It just comes off the top. 10%, it's God's, all of it's God's, but he just asks us to give back 10% to him. I'm talking above and beyond tithing, and I'm not just talking about money. Giving is good. Giving money is good. As a matter of fact, I have, I started teaching in 2005, and around 2006, 2007, I had a young lady that was in my classroom, fifth grade. She was so quiet, such a gentle spirit. And at, she just found out over time that I was a Christian and that my husband was in ministry. And at the end of the school year, I remember this beautiful drawing that she gave me that she had drawn, and it was of Jesus. And it was this beautiful poem about Jesus. Fast forward to 2019, Sarah just landed in Africa where she is going to be a missionary for the summer in Zambia, leading people to Jesus. It is a joy of my heart to send her a check, an offering to support her mission's work. Because guess what? That plane ticket and her food and her housing and living from now until the end of July costs money. And she's not going to be working at Target in Zambia to take care of her finances. She needed support. And I was so happy alongside Brian, to just send her some support. When Brian and I moved here, from Tennessee to here, we had no jobs. We had quit everything. We had sold our house and made maybe $1,000 off of our house. We, we moved in the time where the housing situation was not good. So the $1,000 kind of helped us move here. And Brian eventually got a part-time job at U-Haul as we're trying to start up a church. How in the world did, you, did we survive 
there were people that believed in the mission here in Las Vegas, and they supported us as missionaries. Although their feet are not on the ground here and seeing the beautiful things that we see, every dollar that was given into that ministry has been poured into this church and changing lives. There are people that come into this place and they meet Jesus for the first time and their life is radically changed. You know what? If you're going through a hard time financially, be a good steward, but ask the Lord, what can I do? How can I use my time? God, do you want me to give the $1 that I have extra to a ministry that can further your gospel message? My feet are not in the ground, on the ground in Zambia. But because the Lord gave me an opportunity, I am helping to change lives for people across the world. It's amazing. That's a great way to take our focus off of what's right in front of us and to give and pour into others. You can also give your talents. I don't give my talent of singing because I don't have it. And I know it's a running joke and I say it all the time, but it's for real. But if you have a voice for singing or you know how to play an instrument, they need you up here. Because leading us into worship is beautiful. I love corporate worship. I can worship by myself. I do. But to stand up here and to hear all of my brothers and sisters in Christ singing out their praises and worship together, that is a beautiful sound. Imagine how that sounds to our Lord when he sees his sons and his daughters coming together to worship. Kids ministry. Do you like kids? We love kids. They need you. Let's also, let's move on because this goes hand in hand. Number three is I will focus on serving others. By serving others, it takes our, our focus off of ourself and our lemon and our thing, and it helps to restore our perspective. When we're serving others, we're no longer obsessing over what's right in front of us. We are thinking, you know what? Maybe my problems are really not that big. And if your problems really are that big, because I don't want to discount anybody's lemons and the size of your lemon and what you're carrying. But you serve anyway. You serve knowing that you are walking through a valley and you're serving anyway. You're like Jesus. Because guess what? Jesus knew from the beginning what his end on earth would look like. And he served anyway. He knew that he was the king of kings and lord of lords. He knew it. He didn't act like it. Because he's the one that got down and washed the disciples' feet. He's the one that came to serve and not to be served. He basically came and he was on an aircraft carrier. He wasn't on a cruise ship. He came to serve. He had a work to do. Matthew 20, 26 through 28 says this. Whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be your slave, just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. We are called to serve others even when we are going through our own times of struggle. When we do this, we allow God to use our life to be someone else's lemonade sweetener. Guys, serving is very easy. You can serve here at the church. I know that Trish has a ministry that you can serve with. There are ministries all over this town to serve. Maybe you just go to the park to play with your kids and you take extra waters. Because I guarantee you there's a family at the park like the Mosley family that constantly forgets to take water, although they've lived in the desert for five years. And if you're like, oh, you know what? Do you guys want some water? And they're, oh, that's so nice of you. It may be a family that... It's not a family of Christians that say that was so kind of that family. And they've been watching your actions and they've been watching you with your kids. You never know what that little act will do for someone. Let's wrap this up. I will focus on sharing Christ. Oh, before I get to that, I have to say this. Dream team, if you're on the dream team in here, I want to tell you this. You are not just here taking up a spot. You're not here just filling in a spot. You are here making an eternal difference in people's lives. If you clean those bathrooms on Saturdays, 
I see you. You're making an eternal difference in people's lives. If our bathrooms were nasty, people wouldn't come back. But people come back and they go to clean bathrooms and they hear the word of Jesus in this place. You're not just here to exist, guys. This goes for everyone. God did not put you on this planet just to take up space. There's more to life than life. You have a purpose and you have a plan. And it's a mighty one. I will focus on sharing Christ. This is the most significant thing that you can do. It has the most eternal impact. And you don't have to share Christ in a way that feels contrived and feels pushy or fake. You share Christ by living your life that is a life reflective of Christ. What comes out of your mouth, your actions, what you do, how you lead people. You can invite people to church. You may get rejected and rejected and rejected. But guess what? When they hit a snafu in life, they might be like, oh, yeah, I... That person was always really nice to me. I'm going to go to that church. You don't even have to invite people to come to church. We would love for you to. You can share Christ with them outright in a loving way. Develop a friendship with them. No matter what is going on in your life, there is time to share Christ. When I was in high school, in the midst of ACT testing, for those of you that were here, writing college applications, making sure that I had good grades, keeping up with a boyfriend, trying to be the good daughter that my parents needed me to be, to be, toting my sister around places, having a job, all those things. I asked the Lord, please give me some people that I can invest into. I was a very young Christian, and he sent me two people. And today I'm going to talk quickly about one. His name was Matthew, and he was an underclassman, and we became friends. I think we were in art class or something like that together. And he just noticed that my life was a little bit different, and we were talking on the phone one night, and I led him to Christ. That was probably in 1998 or 1999. Ten years later, in 2009, I get a Facebook message from Matthew, and he's reminding me of that conversation we had on the phone. And that he accepted Christ as his Lord and Savior. And that he had become a chaplain in the United States Army. And he was on his way to Iraq. It was so, that was such a cool message to receive. And Matthew is now the senior pastor of a church in Tennessee. And he and his wife have little boys and they homeschool. And it's just very cool to see how just asking the Lord, send me someone. That's not me. That's all him. You may get rejected. Pastor Brian rejected his friend time and time and time and time again with excuse after excuse why he wasn't going to go to church. And then when life handed him a great big lemon, he called up his buddy. Can I come with you? And it changed the entire trajectory of his life. You never know what an invite will do. If you go, I have the same people at Smith's Click List. Hallelujah for Smith's Click List that bring me my groceries every single week. And we're getting to know each other. It's a great opportunity for me to say, hey, I don't know. If you're not working on a Sunday, come to church. They may be like, you're a weirdo. And I'm going to see you again next week. That's okay. (laughs) Planting seeds. There is more to life than this life. So I have two questions for you. Where is our focus? Are we focusing more on our problems and pain? Or are we focusing more on eternal things? What are we currently doing that is making an eternal impact? What do we need to spend less time doing? Less time focusing on? in order to focus more on the internal, significant goals to which God has called us. Your responses to these questions are going to have an impact one way or the other. I hope it's an eternal impact that your responses have. Don't let your focus be on your lemons, because you're going to miss out on the purpose that God has created you for. Keeping your eyes on eternity will change the way you see everything.
I'm going to invite my friend Star to come up and play a little bit on the piano for me. And I just want, I don't want to miss this opportunity. In case you're in this room, and you've kind of been doing this, this dance of figuring out who Jesus is. And you're really resonated with what I said today about life is full of these lemons and I don't have a clue what to do with these. And they're weighing me down and bogging me down and I just feel heavy. So if you don't know Jesus today and you're like, I, I want that. I want this life where I, it's a life of hope and a life of love and a life that has an eternal purpose then I'm going to invite you to pray with me. And I'm actually going to invite everyone to pray this prayer with me. It's not about my words. It's about your heart. So if you're ready to accept the Lord, Jesus, as your Lord and Savior, and say, I'm a sinner, and Lord, you have cleansed me of all of that sin. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes. Heavenly Father, I repent from being master of my own life. Say that with me. I repent from being master of my own life and living separate from you. I turn away from my sin and I turn toward you. I confess with my mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in my heart that you raised him from the dead. I receive you, Jesus, as my Lord and Savior. I welcome you, Holy Spirit, into my life to rescue and empower me and to restore me to intimacy with my Heavenly Father. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. If you gave your life to Christ today, we welcome you to the family. There are three things that we ask you to do. Please let us know on the connection card that you have given your life to Jesus. We're not going to come and hound you. We want to give you some support. We want to place some materials in your hands that can help you. Sign up to get water baptized on your connection card and make church attendance a priority. Why? Because if you get out there and you try to do it alone, that lemon is going to be right there. And when you come here and into this place, you create a family and you create support And you will find people, and they will disciple you, and they will help you, and you will grow in your walk with the Lord. It's a beautiful, beautiful thing. Please stand with me, church family. I love you. Let me say a blessing over you, and then I want you to have a wonderful Sunday. Lord, I bless your people to be people that have an eternal focus, people that can look beyond their troubles and their lemons, and they can look to the things that are unseen, that they can apply what you have asked them to apply and that they will make eternal differences in this world. God, I love each one. Keep them safe as they go with a blessed week. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I love you guys. Have a great week.